محمد <تصفيق> سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لبدة من لثاني يفقه قولي فبض أمري إلى الله بسير بالعباد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته um, Continuing our journey into um, Ayat Al-Kursi um, I would like to read out now um, a description of Allah's name, al Hay, um, from this beautiful book of divine names by our dear um, Rosina Fozia al Rabi. Uh, it's one of the really, really, I think, better books uh, on the names of God that I usually refer to. Um, and uh, in Ayat al Kursi, we see that um, as we go along in the first verse, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyul qayyum. So we have now started talking about Allah's name, al-hayy. And I'm just inspired to talk a little bit about how hayy and qayyum are connected. Um, they're together. And um, I was also really intrigued today um, at the idea that Allah has this other name, muhyi and Mumit, which we were talking about, and how life and death goes, go together. We talked about that earlier. And the name Wahi means the one who gives life. And al Hay means the one who, is, uh, who lives forever, the one who always exists, the living. And um, it's really beautiful how the, the name Wahi and Mumit come together because there is this understanding that the word muhi is ap applying to somewhat the manifested world where we observe a cycle of life and death. We observe that something that comes to life begins and then ends. And while Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself does not cease to exist, he is always all living, which is denoted by his name Hai, Muhi is indicating that he is the one who is giving life and he is the one who is giving death. So he's the one who is maintaining this cycle of the manifested world where we see that, you know, a seed germinates and takes life and it shoots up and uh, the, the stalk that comes out of the seed, we call it the shoot, it shoots up. And so it is uh, being given life. And then that very plant will have uh, a certain um, duration of life in the manifested world, in, in this seen world. And then it will pass on. It will have a death. And so you, we're seeing that in those two names, we are observing God maintaining a certain uh, discipline, a certain cycle to the way life works. But when we come to Allah's name, al Hay, it's coming with his name, Qayyum. And um, I, I was really uh, inspired to understand the name Qayyum from its root, which is also in the, in the word Qiyam, which is to stand up. And we do Qiyam and Salah. And so we can relate that to the Arabic. And so when we look at the name um, Qayyum, Qayyum is the one who is maintaining that standing up position okay so now when you look at the seed which shoots up you are we are able to determine whether a plant is alive or it has wilted or it is wilting towards death through its position in this in in standing position right so Anyone who, anyone as a human being also who is upright and standing up, we consider them full of life in their youth, you know. And um, when we talk about these elixirs that give youth, you know, that 
um uh, abe hayat we say like the water of life you know it's always considered that you know that um water of life or abe hayat or elixir of life is um, somewhat keeping you in your youth right it's the portion of youth and what is youth it's the upright position the standing position which is an indicator of life so as long as we see the standing up position of a tree of a plant of a human being we consider it in a state of life and so allah subhanahu wa taala uh, is hayy and qayyum he is constantly in that state of youth in the sense of metaphorical uh, vigilance strength energy life and so um, the name al hayy and qayyum are Uh, connected in the sense that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is um, the one who is always existing, and um, in in Kayyum the meaning given over here is the one who exists through himself, the reliable one, right? And we see that even for our help in any situation, um, you know, we call upon that person who is reliable. who can who is going to stand for you stand up for you in your time of need right so this idea of standing up in the name of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala al-qayyum has all these indications of um being in a state of energetic youth and life and al-hayy is indicating that it is constant and qayyum is also in in its meaning it's that it is constant it's all the time so while muhyi and mumit are something that god does to uh, its creation and hence he is the one who is the giver of life uh, my internet has become weak okay so he is the one who is the giver of life and he is the one who is the giver of death um we move and we understand that hayy and qayyum are his attributes which indicate his own quality of how he is now when we do life and we experience the life given from him to us and the death given to us in the quran allah says that he is the one who brings back to life that which was dead talks about the land which was dead right now land itself um, the earth can be taken as an indicator of um in my own this is my own understanding that earth is an indicator of the humility the lowliness of us right um because we say that we are bandai khaki we are the we are the the creation of the dust from dust we come and to dust we return and to be associated with dust is to be humble and when we say uh, hazrat ali was butrab the father of dust perhaps it means that the one who was the master of being humble you know was the master of being um, a, a, a humble servant of god so dust has that indication of humility the soul it becomes alive in a state of humility it becomes alive in a state of um surrendering in a state of uh the soul becomes alive in the state of accepting its lowliness accepting its position as powerless and many times the soul will go through this cycle of life and death where it will experience a death a disconnection a feeling of being in a dark place of hopelessness and of depression of um uh, you know a, a disconnect from the divine so you feel like there's no way out and that state of contraction is like a death and so this uh, human existence keeps going through these cycles of life and death and we experience the life and death of our soul constantly as well and we move through this infinite cycle of uh, moving in and out of states of light and dark and contraction and expansion and so 
the surrender i the surrender that the soul experiences which is like the earth that is dead um it needs to be enlivened it needs to be given life and the life comes to your humility through allah's help so the masters say that the the cutting off of the ego for the ego to die and for humility to emerge for the humility to become alive it is a godly ordained process it is a godly ordained principle it is something that will be given with god's permission and so um we see that um in surrender lies the life of the soul i have written uh, some uh, couplets uh, i happened to write a few couplets on the idea of surrender and i would like to share with you all um just open it okay on the battlefield of duality of sides of right and wrong the opposites are separate waiting to explode the outer realm of dark and light of flight or fight reap ideas of anxiety and revenge yet the planes of soul of unity are far from this chaos there is no you there is no me i'm just mirroring me in the shadows of my own what i give is what i get for there is none but one the illusion of this separation puts me at a war surrendering on the battlefield is nothing but defeat not surrendering in the plane of soul is nothing but defeat the serenity of letting go is nothing short of peace but my dense body pulls me into a dark hole that rises me up to peaks i battle between the two acts of surrender exhausting all my means the two voices that shred me to pieces are the journey to my goal listen to one listen to another i trip i fall i fly the voice of peace will be my voice the one voice of love and joy true freedom lies in letting go and emancipation of the soul and once you're tired of fighting all day come to the peace of surrender so i was inspired to write this because i feel like we go through these experiences within us where when the lower self takes over we go into a state of disconnection with with god because it fills us with ideas of fear and anxiety and separation and then we start seeing ourselves as separate from the other and i was listening to this uh, uh lady i listened to her sometimes her name is teal swan t e a l s w a n teal swan and um, she was saying that all war and all destruction lies in the idea of loneliness and she said that you know because i think she was talking in terms of what's happening in ukraine and war and uh, she was saying that it's only when we feel like we're alone that we're lonely that i am one and you are one and i am separate because i am alone that i can even continue to think of the idea of that you and i are separate and i am not with you so i am alone and that's why i can destroy you i can go to war with you and you are my enemy because there's an idea of this aloneness of this oneness that i am alone there's a loneliness and this loneliness is what makes us forget that in reality we are all just part of that one life and that one life is interconnected so we know that all trees they have this underground connection connecting network um where all the um, you know all the roots of the tree communicate for different reasons and um, you know if you read if you read alishafak's uh, book 
the island of missing trees it's a novel um she's talked a lot about trees because it's a story about a tree talking um it's a fictional story interesting but she she has brought in a lot of facts about trees into the discussion and so you see that these trees are constantly communicating and talking in fact the fungi on the roots of the of the trees um they will pass on messages in fact they will give a message from uh, from a tree who's not well who's dying and will give the message to other trees that this tree is not doing well and through that communication uh the healthier trees will pass on nutrients and nourishment for this tree that's dying and so we see that there is a life and there's a maintenance of life and there's a communication and this life is maintained through connectedness through being connected and all of us as human beings have this inner need to stay connected in a state of network and that's why it is important that we understand that we are not disconnected just because of the illusionary borders that the world has created around different countries you know and especially uh, for us living in the subcontinent um separating india and pakistan really doesn't may, i mean yeah there are political benefits and all of that but when we meet each other as people outside our country we don't understand this difference because we're so alike you know our our language um our ideas our culture our the way we look you know we all look so similar and so you know these ideas of separation are not our fitrat they're not our basic nature in reality our nature and our uh, fitrat and our by default we align with being one we want unity we want that connectedness and that connectedness cannot be denied because like we said last time that all life is being sustained by one life the muhi is coming from hai and the life that we are being given is coming from the ever living the always existing one the one who lives forever but also the one who is the only existence he is the only existence there is only one existence so there is a constant connection and um, there is this analogy that i was discussing with my teacher many years ago that all of us are like smartphones each one of us is like a smartphone but all of us are connected to one i cloud okay so whatever we see on the phone is actually coming from the same base base the same database our our point of connection is the same source of knowledge of life of sustenance of ideas the mind of god is the only mind that is the only source of knowledge that is the only source of life and all of us are just illusions of that life you know we are we are only in an illusion of separation so if all of the smartphones are connected to one i cloud then in reality the the real is the i cloud right because all of the data all of the knowledge all of the information all of the apps all of the work is constantly being interacted with that i cloud and that i cloud is you know the storage space from where we take information and reflect through the phone so even if the phone dies we're safe right because we have a backup we have that i cloud and even if the phone is um, it shuts down but when it turns on it it will start reflecting the information which was in the i cloud so the phone is not real the phone is not the real existence the phone doesn't is not the source or the original uh, place of that information or life or anything but it is just a reflection it is just a, an extension just a representation of what actually lies in the i cloud and that's why you know we give the example of the wave and the ocean that our existence as human beings we are sustained through the ocean 
ocean sustains the current of the waves, right? Um, and yet the, the wave is made up of the ocean, but, and even though every drop of the ocean contains within it the, uh, the DNA or the, 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 the information of the entire ocean, we can take it from one drop. And like, you know, mystics say that the whole ocean is in one drop. And yet the, the drop is not the ocean, right? Because the ocean is the reality. So the, the waves, the drops, they're sustained by the ocean, but they're not the ocean entirely. And so the life that is sustained and given can only be sustained and given from the source, which is always living. Because if the source was not always living, then what it sustains cannot be sustained like this. Even though, even though the waves, they, they, in the currents, they come alive and then they die and they go back and then you have new waves coming in all the time. But the wave has a source which is constantly alive. The ocean is constantly alive. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is the living, the one who lives forever, and the one who, who always exists. Now I'm going to read from this book. The divine name contains the quality of that which is alive beyond the ephemeral. It is the eternal life. It contains the eternity of life without beginning or end, beyond time and space. May this divine name remind you with every breath that your life and your longing belong to Allah. Repeating this name awakens the light of unity in the heart. It is one of the names constantly repeated by the angel Jibreel, peace be upon him. Al-Hay and Al-Muhi both come from the root Hayawa. Al-Hay carries a high life energy that is intensively activated by the repetitions. It gives strong force to the body and stimulates its magnetism almost unlike any other name. Energize your body and mind and share this energy with everyone, everything around you as a gift to yourself. Ibn al-Arabi explains the distinction of this name. After al-Wahid and al-Ahad, al-Hay occupies the highest position of all divine names. All other divine names can only enter reality after Allah has given Hay, life to the universe. Then comes Al-Alim and consciousness flows into the creation. Breathing is life. Inhale, inhale the strength around you, then exhale and let the grass blade grow beneath you, wherever you go. Bring life to people, animals and plants. Life is joy. Connect with the magnetic field of the cosmos and express this force in your words thoughts and deeds become one with the rhythm of life that is al-hay al-hay the living is the opposite of al-mayyit the dead life al-hayat derives from al-hay when people are sharp noble and decent they are said to have a living heart hayal qulu when they are blinkered and thoughtless they are said to have a dead heart mayyat al qulu the divine name Al-Hay is used first and foremost to awaken the heart. Its repetition fills the heart with the light of unity. Okay. So I'm just going to stop here and talk a little bit about the ideas we have read today. And, um, um, you know, it said that Al-Hay is the name that will... Uh, it, it is because of this name that other names of God enter the realm of reality. So now we can say that in the world, in the seen world, in the manifested world, all the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can only be observed in their reality because of their uh, existence, because of their manifested nature. And how does that happen is that if, for example, um, this is what uh, Rumi says, that this is a world of opposites. And through the opposites of this world, we can experience um, the manifestation of God's attributes. And so if all the 
attributes of God have to be seen in this world, they go through the passage of being brought to life. Now imagine the interesting thing is that, like we discussed last time, that life itself cannot be experienced unless death accompanies it. Otherwise, you can't differentiate between life and death. And the same way for all of the names of God to manifest themselves in the manifested world, they're brought to life through their opposites. How is that um, one of the teachers I was listening to, uh, Sayyid Abbas Razavi, gave this really beautiful example. And he said that in order for us to experience um, the healing from a doctor, there needs to be the existence of a disease. And unless and until there is no disease in the world, a doctor cannot use its own healing power to manifest to us the idea or the process of healing. Okay. So if you think about a doctor, it's a paradox. A doctor never wants anyone to be sick because the doctor is striving for a world which is free of sickness. And yet a doctor cannot manifest to the world that it is a doctor, it is, he is a, she is a healer, unless the doctor experiences disease. And so when there is disease in the world, the doctor can go and try to uh, you know, use his skills and knowledge to heal that person. And through that process, the doctor is revealing its quality of being al-shafi, of being a healer, of the one who heals. So in order for the quality of healing to manifest itself, we need disease. In the same manner, if someone needs to manifest, their, um, if God needs to manifest mercy, then there needs to be a situation where there's cruelty. And only through the opposite of that situation, through poverty, through sickness, through, um, through cruelty, we can be in a position to, to show kindness, right? And um, there's, a, there's a saying of Hazrat Ali, which uh, is very close to my heart. And he says, if the bad don't leave their bad, why should the good leave their good, right? And what that saying is that through the continuous cycle of the existence of the bad and their, con con and their continuous perpetrations, the ones who are in a, in a state of godliness and goodness get the opportunity to manifest goodness and godliness. Now, the idea of coming to that this place of understanding that opposites exist. I think I will take your permission. And if you allow me, and I know, I mean, it's just an etiquette that I'm practicing here. <laughs> the idea is that we have to be grateful to our enemy. We have to be grateful to sickness. We have to be grateful to cruelty to create that opportunity for goodness to manifest itself. And therefore, when we talk about the devil or the shaitan or the negative aspect or the darkness, we have to understand that without the existence of that darkness, without the existence of the, of the per se devil and its acts, the good cannot manifest their good. It is not possible for us to understand light without the dark, to be grateful for sickness unless, uh, sorry, to be grateful for health unless we had experienced sick sickness. And so we come to this understanding of unity where we understand that unless and until there wasn't all of these negative aspects to the manifested world, the good aspects cannot be experienced. And in that way, we are in a state of unity. The dark and the light work together for an experience called life, existence. And in that sense, we are working harmoniously 
to keep manifesting an experience of godliness and goodliness. And what I mean by that is that God said, I was a hidden treasure and I wished to be known. And wherever you turn is the face of God. So how do you know this face of God? Through the play of light and dark, through the play of dark and evil, the good, dark and light, good and evil, and the opposite. And so we see that in the end, Everywhere we turn is the face of God. And in the end, everything is happening with the will of God. Nothing is bereft. Nothing is outside the plan or the, like, like the, uh, the consent of God. Everything is within his permission. So evil is also operating within his permission. And death is also existing through his permission. And so the op existence of opposites is a divine plan. And therefore, the, the system of this life is meticulously designed by the all-living God who gives life through a sense of unity of these opposites that work together. Now, when we experience difficulties in life, when we see war in the world, where when we experience sickness, like we've, we've been going through the pandemic and the difficulties that have come into our lives because of that, and now we are experiencing war, um, it's all part of a meticulous divine plan. It is not outside God's plan. And so nothing happens without his permission. It cannot. Because the manifested world is a world where something has to be manifested. Something has to be experienced. It is a world of experiencing. And we feel like it is our job to bring the world to a place of perfection. We have to fight for justice and we have to fight for we fight against war and all of that. But the intention and the purpose of all of this is, is that we, we, we have to be in a state of conscious intention of the self-purification at all times, even if it is protesting against a war, even if it is protesting against injustice. Because, <clears throat> like I said, when we think that the right and the wrong are enemies, then we ourselves are perpetrating an energy of hatred and anger. Okay. So um, I was listening to one of my really favorite teachers. Her name is Biki Shivani. And I listened to her a lot. And I was listening to her and she was explaining the idea of anger. And she said that when we are angry and when we... Um, send out this idea of anger, um, then the other person should get affected by our anger and they should feel sad and down and affected and you know they should feel um, all of these energies of inner burning and you know anger. But in reality, even before we affect anybody with that energy of anger, we ourselves, are feeling the anger. We ourselves are affected by that energy of anger. And so whatever we send out and whatever we give is actually not being given out. It is actually be being given to the self. So whatever we are giving out, it's not even going around anywhere. It's actually just being received. Because going back to the idea that, yes, we are all one, Going back to the idea that, yes, we are all part of the same um, life force. We are all connected as one. So in the end, what we are giving is just being received constantly, immediately. It's not even like, you know, the idea of karma, that what you, what you give out is what you get and what you sow is what you reap. It's an immediate thing too in the in, in our world. When we're giving out anger, we're constantly receiving it to ourselves. And that's why um, um, she was explaining how in relationships, 
when we have differences. Um, if we are constantly giving out this energy to the other person that you are wrong, you are wrong, you are wrong, it's actually just that energy coming back to me because my thoughts are affecting this energetic field that I'm in and I'm affecting the energy that I'm receiving. So what I'm going to reflect back in my own life is people pointing fingers at me and saying, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. Because when you're giving something, you're actually receiving it. We're one energetic body. And so she, she suggested a practice. She said, from now on, we should change our thoughts. Instead of saying, you are wrong, we can say, you are different, I am different. And we both accept each other. I accept you, you accept me with our difference. And what that does is that it dissolves this idea of pointing fingers at each other and creates a harmony in diversity. We accept that people are different. You are different. I am different. I accept you. You accept me. Now, a lot of times we struggle with acceptance from the other people in our lives that they don't accept me. They don't accept me. And the idea is that <clears throat> them not accepting is a reflection of something about ourselves that we are not accepting. And the narrative in our mind or the thoughts in our mind <clears throat> are of non-acceptance. And for us to want this, um, if we want this reflected back to us, if we want to be accepted, we have to be the first ones accepting the other. So how is it possible that if we don't accept the other, that they accept us? And sometimes, or a lot of times that I've experienced, we are put in a position where we have to accept what we think is wrong. And that is why in the realm of unity, in the realm of oneness, Constantly pointing fingers and saying you're right and you're wrong creates a lot of division. It creates a lot of um, separation. That is beca what becomes the cause of war, becomes the cause of death, right? Now, aren't we always taught that we should speak up against uh, injustice and we should stand against the wrong? And I believe that <clears throat> that also should be something guided from deep within us because, okay, so this is something I do tell people and I think it's a good opportunity for me to share. A lot of times, <clears throat> with, because of our very close association with uh, Hazrat Imam Hussain alayhi salam and the story of Karbala, the narrative that we're constantly taught is a very instigated narrative of right and wrong and enemies and we have to stand up and state our voice and we have to speak up and be angry and you know um, all of that but what we miss out in all of this is that that is not the first step first of all the second thing is that the life of imam hussein -Islam and the event of karbala happened to one person which includes imam hussein who was a sage, a wise man, a, a, you know, he was, a, he was a guiding light for us. And he was surrounded in certain circumstances where he had to act in a certain way. That doesn't mean that that is how we act in all circumstances, because we see that we have more other role models, like we have the role model of the Holy Prophet And in his life, he, he also only fought uh, defensively, his, his, uh, his battles were never an, uh, an offensive battle. It was only for defense, number one. And number two, uh, we see that he avoided all kinds of clash and confrontation and war to the maximum. So that was not the first thing. The first thing, what we see from our Holy Prophet is Rahmatullah. He was able to convince most people about the truth 
through his kindness and his character and his mercy. And so we, we should not discount all of the other events in the lives of all the other sages, like the Prophet, like Imam Ali, -Islam, like even his progeny, like we look at the life of Imam Zain al -Abidin. Even after the tragedy of Karbala, he refrained from war. He didn't go into war. Um, and he had a very passive way of, of exuding his light. And we see that a lot of, we see, we see Hazrat Imam Hassan al -Islam. In his life too, he was all about peace. And people even um, sadly, you know, said that he was cowardly because he didn't fight and all of that. But those statements come from a place of very egoic instigation. When we say that somebody is like that, it's because um, we need to understand that, that in reality, we are just one existence. And uh, there's a practice that <clears throat> a lot of sages give us. And I think Bulam uncle also shared with me during the week. And it reminded me of, uh, so the, the meditation that he shared with me is called I am. I am that I am. And um, that is something I originally learned from uh, Neil Donald Walsh because I was teaching a course that he had, uh, it's his course. Uh, he's the author of the books, Conversations with God. And uh, on Mind Valley, he has a course called Awaken the Species. And I was teaching that course for a while. And in that course, he gives you a practice and he says that we are all one. And so in order to experience this oneness, when you go out, practice, that you look at somebody and you start saying, I am that, I am that, I am that, right? So that's, I am that, I am, I am that, I am. So you just say, I am that, I am that. And initially, you know, um, it's very interesting because when we practice it, I am that, um, we're like, I'm not that beggar on the street. I am not that rapper on the street. I am not that uh, policeman on the street. Why am I, why am I saying I am that? Man, I'm not that. I am not that. Right? Our, the first voice within us says, I'm not that. But actually, I would really urge you all to just go and practice it. Look at someone and then just keep um, either keep focusing on them or keep looking at them or in your mind's eye, focus on them and keep saying, I am that, I am that, I am that. And then just observe what happens because you will feel a shift after a little while. Um, but to give away a little bit that this, what this practice does is that it will activate a lot of parts of you that you are seeing in that person. It will activate to you an awareness of your own self, which is of that person, but which is a part of you. And so the, the idea here is that we practice this little practice that I'm telling because um, Learning through experience is a completely different experience compared to me just telling you something, you know. Um, and, and when we experience that learning, we call it the knowledge of presence because it, it's a presence of the heart. It's a, it's a change. It's a knowledge that descends on the heart through practice. It is not something that you receive in a bookish way through what you say and what you read. So, um, what you experience there is that that oneness between you and that being, whoever it is. Um, if they are, uh, you know, filthy on the road and they're a beggar, you will start to notice parts of you which are in a state of begging. We are needy, aren't we? There are parts of us that we think are filthy. There are parts of us that we feel are in need, in faqar. We're, we're fakirs. And so when we practice these kind of things given to us from the mystics, I'm just saying what I'm saying. When we practice these things, we experience a state of oneness. 
it's a kind of oneness we experience with our children, you know, that their pain is our pain. That something happens to them, we get affected. But in reality, we're all one. We're all part of that one life force. And everyone's pain and everyone's anxiety is part of our own reality. And um, uh, I, will share, I will share a link with you guys on the group. Um, there is a, a Twitter thread that my teacher shared with me. Um, what it's explaining is that after the, after the war in Ukraine started, uh, statistically, it has been noticed that there are more uh, accidents on the road. And um, what is being noticed is that there's an overall increase in the anxiety in the world. And even without knowing, we are in a state of restlessness. We're in a state of pain and anxiety. And um, <clears throat> what it's showing is that because we are interconnected beings, people who have chosen to do the work to be more awakened, to be more sensitive, are feeling it more. But overall, because it is the same life energy, that same life force, we're all connected to each other. Um, all of us are experiencing a state of lowness and an anxiety and state of upset and a heightened state of sensitivity to pain. So what, if an event or if an, if an incident in our life would usually trigger us a little bit and we would get over it, right now that little thing feels really big. It, it's very like, uh, you know, magnified. The feeling is magnified because we're in a broken state right now. Our fellow brothers and sisters are in pain. There's, a, there's an injustice happening, which has, which has created anxiety on the planet Earth. So the energy is one, the life force is one, the anxiety is one, and we're all feeling its effects because we're all interconnected with this one life force. And um, what he was explaining is that even at home, if little incidents happen, some of us will feel them re as really big. In fact, um, one of the days, a friend of mine messaged me saying, how are you doing? I'm just checking on you. Uh, and, and I said, why, what happened? And, and, and I think I was feeling low uh, on that particular day. And I said, yeah, a little low. And she said, yeah, that's fine. Just be aware because a lot of us are feeling that today for no reason. I mean, we can't figure out that reason. But a lot of times we feel that because we are all one life. We're all connected. Right. So, um <clears throat> We, we've been discussing this one life and one force and the idea of unity that life, one life brings. And the idea that within this unity lies the opposites and these opposites are working as God's agencies. Now, you know, I can just go on talking about these metaphysical or philosophical ideas and you can hear me and I can talk but how does it help us in our daily lives with our interactions in our ikhlaq is that faced with a difficult situation is an opportunity for a godly character to be activated, right? A place where there is pain is a place where you can forgive somebody who's inflicted that pain. If there wasn't any pain, there is no way for you to forgive. What are you going to forgive, right? I mean, how, how do you manifest al-ghafur or al-ghafar or al-af, right? So that's why that pain has come into our life as an agency of God, for us to now be awakened, uh, jolted back into an, a conscious state of intention. And intention is to manifest godliness because by manifesting godliness to our character, 
we become like God and in becoming like God, we come closer and closer to God. And to find proximity and that laqa Allah, the meeting with God, we have to be like him. We cannot be like him unless we can manifest his qualities. And his qualities can only be expressed when we are faced with the opposite. And so in a state of pain, we get the opportunity to be the forgiving one. I'm not saying it's easy. And I'm not saying we can forgive. I, mean, I, I, I go through those experiences all the time. But the idea is that when I can't forgive and when I'm in pain and it is excruciating, then that helplessness to forgive connects me back to my earthly humility. And I can feel that I'm not able to forgive. There's a part of me that is disconnected, that doesn't have the power to forgive. I now need to go back and connect to my source. And the life-giving source to the soul is in humility and accepting that I can't. I just can't. I just can't do it. I'm not able to. I'm in too much pain. I'm too angry. I'm too sensitive. I just can't. And a lot of times these states don't uh, just happen, you know, like um, pain escalates time escalates, our energies deplete, and then slowly, slowly, Allah brings us into positions in life where we just can't let go of the hurt or forgive the pain um, or move on with the situation. In those moments of helplessness and neediness, when we, it's not just saying from the mouth, but truly within our beings, we experience that I can't do it, um, we say, God, can you please help me? You know, and that that comes out from the heart, which says, God, can you please help me? It is a very beautiful moment of of an awareness of God's help and presence in our life. The fact that He's ever living, He's ever standing by us, the high and the Qayyum. And that state of awareness is a state where for that millisecond, you can say that, God, I cannot forgive, but I'm ready to allow you to help me forgive. And I'm ready to now ask you, can you please help me surrender? Or can you please help me uh, do what I need to do? Uh, something that I just don't want to do. I don't want to meet this person and I have to, but I can't and I don't know how to. Okay, I, I don't, I'm not consciously doing it because I don't feel like doing it, but I know it's the right thing. Can you please help me? I'm ready. You know, and a lot of times that is the moment of communication with God that connects us back into that life with him, that source. And then he enables it. And again, Dr. Wayne Dyer says, don't say how, say yes. And that is that moment. Why? Because the reason we're unable to do something, the reason we're unable to forgive someone, the, the reason we're unable to do that difficult thing is because we're constantly feeling like I can't do it. Why can I not do it? It's because I don't know how I'll do it. How will I go about it? How will I manage all those, you know, exaggerated emotions? How will I deal with the pain? How will I, how will I do it? Because I don't feel like I'm capable of doing it. I feel weak. I feel small. I feel contracted. I feel uh, like I don't have the energy. I'm so exhausted. I'm so tired. Um, I've done enough. And then in that moment when you realize that there is this all living, always fresh, like a youthful energy standing by you, 
And you can say, I don't know how, but you know what? I say yes. I say yes to doing the right thing. So God, I don't know how I'll do it, but I say yes. Can you please help me do it? I set the intention to let you help me do this. And, you know, in that many second, we experience that, that free will that, that is part of the present moment experience. Because in that present moment, you are willing to say yes. La bank, yes, I, I come back. I'm saying yes, I'm present, I'm, I'm here now, and I don't know how it's going to happen, but with your life force and with your energy and with your um, <clears throat> presence, you will take me and make me do this because I'm powerless. So now I remove myself from the way and I let you work through me and I'll be a conduit and your power and your life and your energy will work through me and take me where I need to be, which is the right thing to do. And in that sense, um, what we experience is connecting back to the true source of life. And that connection back to life can be experienced with its sweet joy only after experiencing this connection in death. And I will end my session here by uh, expressing something that Rumi shares in his work, where he says that, you know, all these people, they keep asking that if the journey is from home back home, then what was the purpose of this exercise? You're leaving home, you're going back home. What was the purpose of this exercise? And Rumi says that it's only when the fish is out of the water that the fish experience the pain of separation from life. And then it shivers, it trembles in its state of disconnection, yearning to go back to life. And in that yearning is the experience of wanting the beloved. And that yearning is the experience of tasting the sweetness of going back home. And that is the purpose of the manifested world, to experience these feelings of contraction, expansion, pain, and relief. And something else that just came to my mind is that I'm studying um, uh, treaties of Ibn Sina on joy and happiness. And he's, uh, he's done a lot of philosophical extraction of what is joy and what is happiness and how we experience it. And one of the points he says is that, that one of the only ways that we can experience joy and happiness is when we have experienced the absence of that thing. So until and unless we don't experience sickness, we will not feel that constant gratitude for health. So sometimes, you know, when we break a bone or we go through a sickness like COVID or something, and, you know, in COVID last, last time when I got COVID, I couldn't taste the food. And it was that moment where I was shocked back into realizing the gift of taste because I was taking it for granted, right? And so the idea and the purpose of the manifested world is to experience and experiences can only be experienced through their opposites. And therefore we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all of our experiences all the time. So let us put our hands up for a dua. Oh Allah, we come to you in our weak and confused states trying to make sense and trying to find stability and trying to find that grounding where we can finally feel safe. But that safety can be dangerous because it puts us into complacency. So Ya Allah, we come to you to make this path easy for us. That we feel the coolness of your presence and the warmth of your embrace constantly 
to traverse through the dark and the light, to the up and the down, to the anxieties and the pangs of pain, and through moments of relief, always in a constant state of gratitude, always in a constant state of your praise, and always in a constant state of surrendering to your meticulous plan and your will. Oh Allah, we come to you asking you and yearning for your constant presence. Because if your presence occupies my heart, then we can go through any experience and we can go through any up and down without losing ourselves and getting distracted in this world of duality. Oh Allah, keep us grounded in your unity and love always and make us a means of this love and unity for the world which is aching in pain and make us a means of spreading this light even if it's merely through our presence for kind words, a smile to somebody. Oh Allah, we give ourselves in your protection and your love and your mercy, for we cannot rely on ourselves for any of this. Oh Allah, we are distracted and we lose our attention and we lose our presence moment to moment. So oh Allah, we hand over ourselves to you. Oh Allah, take us in your protection of guidance and constant love and mercy. Amin, Ya Rabbul Alam. We'll end the session here. Oh, sorry, stop the recording.